Root Magic, Chapter 11 The whole month of October flew by like a hawk chasing after a rat marsh rabbit. So much was happening that I could hardly keep up with it. My very first root spell, the bag that I'd hidden a wish for a friend, seemed to have finally kicked in because Susie and I were hanging out every day at lunch and walking home from school together most days. Well, we left school together, but she and I separated at the top of the road that led to our house. She never actually came down the road with me. One time I asked if she wanted to come over. She paused like she wanted to say no, but also didn't want to be rude. I didn't want to make her feel bad, and I definitely didn't want to embarrass myself, so I didn't ask her again. Maybe the spell would take a little longer than I thought. At the same time, Miss Watson was giving me more homework than I'd ever had before, and it took me so long to get through it. Once Mama had been had seen how much I had, she insisted I do it immediately after school, and so Doc moved root work lessons to after dinner. Since then, me and Jay almost never talked, home, walked home from school together. He didn't have nearly as much homework to do, and he had more friends than he knew what to do with. To tell the truth, I started to miss him. We used to do everything together, talk about everything. Now it seemed he had friends and sports and games, all these things that didn't include me. When I told Dinah about it, after Jay had started snoring, her little red stitched mouth wobbled, but she didn't do anything except lay her tiny cloth hand on my arm. Was this something I should have known would happen? How could we stay close when we were in different classes and he was so interested in things that had nothing to do with me? Jay loved the plane Mama and Doc gave him for his birthday and kept it in a special place in our room. He even talked about being a pilot one day. I wasn't sure I even knew my brother that well anymore. Not long after October started, he took his bracelet apart and stuffed a few of the devil's shoestrings into a small felt bag that he wore around his neck. I asked him what else was in the bag, but he wouldn't tell me. He said Doc told him that if he revealed what was in it, it would make the root bag worthless. I just nodded, feeling more alone than ever. And, ne and I never went out to the marsh anymore. I didn't want to, not without Jay, even though I missed it. The rustle of cord grass calmed me. I loved ebb tide when the pluff mud bubbled and flood tide when the waters lapped gently against the shore. And now that I wore my bracelet for protection, I felt safer than I had before. I also carried a pouch of the graveyard dirt mixed with powdered brick dust from Doc. I didn't sprinkle it on anything, but I had it in case I needed to. Before I knew it, November had rolled around, and that first Saturday, Doc sent me and Jay to work making simple oils for him to sell in the shop. He said that Boss Fix, Steady Work, and Fast Luck oils were the most popular ones this time of year. He almost couldn't keep them in stock. Them stocked. When Mama got home from the market, she watched us measure, mix, and smell the oils, then make labels for each one of them. Jay was better at drawing the pictures, and I was better at the handwriting, making the letters clear and even on the paper. Mama looked at the row of clear glass bottles lined up on the kitchen work table. Hmm, she said. People shouldn't place all their hopes on these rubs and things. Maybe if they read about King Solomon in the Bible instead of using that oil with his name, they'd be better off. I looked at her strangely while Jay went to grab some book. Probably to look up what King Solomon oil was for. I wanted to remind him that King Solomon was the one who was wise enough to get the stolen baby fight worked out. Before I could ask Mama how she knew what that oil was for, she guessed my question. Just because I don't practice root doesn't mean I don't know a little something about what, what are y'all doing. Your grand was my mama too, you know. She pressed her fingers to her back and groaned like she was holding something heavy and somebody had just told her to keep it five more minutes. Get on with it now. She sat, sashayed out of the kitchen and a moment later I heard her in her bedroom humming. One fine day, by the chiffons along with the radio and sweeping the floor, I moved on with my work, crushing up some cinnamon with a rolling pin, then tiptoeing to put all my weight on it, that it would turn into a powder. I scraped up most of it with my fingers into a little scoop Doc had given me and poured about a teaspoonful into each jar of oil in front of me. The leftover powder covered my fingers and part of the back of my hand. The cinnamon was the same color as me. And so I pressed my fingers into it and spread some of the powder onto my face like Mama did with her makeup when she went to church. I looked into the side of, of one of her shiniest pans to see what I looked like, but I only saw a blur. Once the potions were fi finished, I would go to the mirror and look at myself properly. Jay came in from washing some more bottles and placed the box of empties on the table next to where I was working. You making follow me, boy oil? I nodded. Smells like cinnamon in here, he said, sniffing. He sniffed the table, then the bottles, then he came close to me. 
You smell like it too. What's that on your face? Nothing, I said. Mama won't let you wear no makeup. You're too young. It isn't. Ugh. Before I could deny I was wearing makeup again, Jay was sniffing, had sniffed my face, then licked my cheek from chin to my ear. It was like being licked by a happy dog, but one that smelled like peanuts. I pushed him off me. What are you doing? He laughed. You put cinnamon on your face. He held on to his belly while he doubled over with laughter. Like you a grown-up lady? Shut up, I said, going back to my oil making. You got the rest of the stuff, and leave me alone if you can't stop laughing. Jay held out a bag of devil's shoestring, his face still in a wide grin. When I took it from him, he giggled again before leaving me alone in the kitchen and heading outside. I just finished crushing up and mixing in the last of the cinnamon and screwed on the top of the final bottle of oil when I heard Jay call for me. I went outside about to tell him off for teasing me when I saw all the funny was gone out of his face. He rubbed at a cluster of mosquito bites on his arm. Help me, Jazzy, he said. You should be helping me. I got to get labels on these. Later, he said, go down to the marsh. His voice was trembling and his skinny body was shaking like he was standing in a strong wind. I'll get Mama. For what? What's down there? It had to be something terrible if he wanted to involve Mama. Usually, he decide, we decided together what we could and couldn't get out of without asking the adults for help. Please, Jezebel, just go. Under the big live oak, maybe you can do something before I can get Mama. His eyes begged me to stop asking questions. We both knew he would have to tell Mama the whole story before she would bring herself down to see anything. Okay, I said. I turned tail as he made for our house. A pitchfork and shovel lay against the cabin. I took the pitchfork just in case there was danger and sped down the path. The sun was high in the clear sky, and I had to squint my eyes tight against the brightness. But I knew this part of our farm for, by memory. I could likely run from home to the marsh with my eyes closed. Once the grass surrounding the marsh was in sight, I slowed down. I approached the old oak cautiously, my heart pumping in my chest. I looked around, but I didn't see anything or anyone. I leaned the pitchfork against the tree. Was Jay playing a joke on me? That's when I heard it. A muffled whimper. A whine, really. Something in pain. I moved towards the sound slowly and carelessly, still not sure what I would find out there. The noises were hushed and only came every so often. I had to stay still until I heard them again, then move in the direction of what I'd heard. Grasses were tall near the marsh, even around tree trunks, and they grazed my knees. As I got closer, I heard a low woof. Finally, I parted the grass near the foot of the tree. I saw the animal lying on its side with his back against the tree. It wasn't moving. It was a coyote. And it was hurt. It's okay, I said gently. I stepped closer, being careful where I put my feet. Daddy used to tell us to always have caution with animals. This was the same kind of animal we had to hide our chickens from, but it was still hurting. It tried to sit up and move to see where I was, but it couldn't. It gave a pitiful cry, then lay back down. My heart broke. I wanted to run to Mama or out in the woods to find out, but I couldn't. My feet stayed where they were. Poor baby, I said, I won't hurt you. I knew what Mama and Doc would do. If there was an animal she thought would kill our chickens, Mama would kill that animal first. She wouldn't let an animal, wild animal take food out of our mouths. And I knew Doc wouldn't hesitate to kill an injured animal from the marsh either. But what would I do? I spun my bracelet around and ran on my wrist, thinking. Root work was about helping. No one had ever said anything about only helping people. Becoming the root worker Gran said I could be meant making a choice here and now. I looked over the animal, and it was beautiful. Its fur was a mix of light and dark brown, thick and bristly, and it had a bushy tail. It gave another wolf, but this one was more tired and sounding than the first. I looked closer, and that's when I saw the trap. It was made of metal with rusty teeth that sank into the coyote's back leg like monster jaws. Blood coated the metal and darkened the animal's fur. I didn't know who'd set the trap, but I knew it was there to catch things like coyotes. Even though the coyotes tried to steal our chickens, I knew it was because they were hungry. It wasn't right for them to be trapped like this. It's going to be okay, I whispered again. I wasn't sure it would be, though. I looked back up the path to the house. No sign of Jay coming with Mama. I was on my own. I crouched down near the animal's head. His ears tipped forward and his eyes followed me. I hummed to it in a low voice and held out my hand. At first, the coyote seemed unsure, but it sniffed me weakly. The scent of the oils and the roots stuck to my hand, so I smelled like the earth. I pulled my hand out of the bracelet Doc gave me for my birthday. Carefully, I unbraided each of the devil's shoestrings he had woven together. Then I lay out them around the coyote in a big circle. This is to protect you, okay? I want to help. Will you let me? 
The coyote tried again to move, but yelped and gave up. It pressed itself into the ground like it wanted to die. Not yet, all right. At least let me try and get you out. It snuffed and licked my hand. I tried not. I took that to mean you can try. I grabbed the pitchfork and shuffled over to the rusted metal trap. Still humming softly, I placed the tines of the pitchfork into the narrow opening between the jaws of the animal trap. Carefully not to touch the injured leg, I pushed the fork in until it touched the ground. Okay, little one. I breathed out a long stream of air. Here we go. My hands wrapped around the handle of the pitchfork, and I wiggled it back and forth, but the trap didn't move. It was shut tight. The poor thing whimpered. I'm sorry that didn't work. I wiped my hands on my dress to get the sweat off. I had no idea how to open the trap. Think, Jezebel, think. This time last year, we shucked oysters. Their shells were tightly closed, even after Mama steamed them. She let us try and get them open on our own. Then she showed us how to slide a knife in the side of the shell, then twist. If we got it right, the shell would pop open, and we could pull out the soft, jiggly meat inside. Think I got it this time, I told the Cody, who was panting by now. Again, I gripped the handle of the pitchfork. With all my might, I twisted. The trap groaned, but didn't move. I wrapped both hands around the handle and ground my feet deep into the soft black dirt. I gritted my teeth and twisted hard, harder than I'd ever turned anything in my life. Heat built up under my hands as I turned the handle. In science lessons, Miss Watson called it friction, forced between two things trying to slide across each other. My palms were slipping, but I didn't stop. I groaned. My hands burned, and a splinter worked its way into my palm. Please, I begged, please open. The trap groaned. The rusty metal jaws creaked, then started to separate. Cody whined as the terrible teeth came out of its leg. Once the teeth were out, it drew its leg out of the trap altogether. By this time, I could hear Mama coming down the path, telling Jay's, he telling Jay's head a mess about what she was going to do if this was some kind of joke. When she got over the last rise, she started running, hurried over to where I was, and pulled me back from the trap, and the teeth snapped shut with a loud clang over the pitchfork. Jezebel, what in blazes are you doing? That's an animal trap. Mama grabbed my hands and looked at them. My palms were red and sore. A few splinters peeked out of my skin. Why were you messing with that horrible thing? I was trying to get it open. Jay said something about a dog. Mama looked around. I did too, but there was no sign of the animal. It must have limped off when Mama and Jay came. It was a Cody, not a dog, I said. It had its leg caught in the trap, but I got it out. Good Lord, Mama said, you could have really been hurt. That animal could have bitten you. It's my fault, Jay said. I told Jess that I needed help. I begged her to come down here. I couldn't let it die, Mama. The pain in my hands I'd ignored earlier was worse now. Burning. I looked at my hands and some of the skin was torn, rubbed away. Mama pressed her lips together. I knew she wanted to yell at me, but she didn't. I don't see any Cody, you two. I looked around. She was right. The Cody was gone. It was here a second ago, I promise. I didn't want to get in trouble again, but I was glad at least I saved a life. If I got more punishment or a whipping, I'd hold on to that fact. Stay back, both of you. Mama picked up a rock from under a nearby tree and pushed down on the side of the trap. The jaws sprang apart, and we all jumped. Mama pulled the pitchfork out of the ground, then lightly tapped the open trap with the side of the fork. It snapped closed, empty this time. How'd you know how to do that? Jay asked. It's our trap, she said. But how did it get out here? Doc usually keeps it in his cabin. We'd never set it out here where kids could step on it. The trap was mean-looking, crusted with rust and edged with bloody teeth. I shuddered. Why do you even have something like that, Mama? It belonged to my grandmama. Plantation owners used to set these same traps for our people. She had helped to take it off a man who was running away to escape slavery. She tried to give it back to him, but he told her to keep it. He didn't want a reminder. Mama picked up the trap by, by its short chain. Limp for the rest of his life, my grandma said. We were quiet until a long yip and howl echoed through the marsh. Wow, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. There it is, I pointed over there. The coyote was at the edge of the forest surrounding the marshland. It was with another smaller coyote that looked the same. Mama's gaze followed my finger. That isn't a coyote, Jezebel. That's a red wolf. I gasped, a red wolf? The wolf leaned its head way back and let out a howl. The smaller one followed. Their song filled the forest and drifted over the quiet marsh. Then they both edged away deeper into the woods. I think that was a thank you, Mama said. I smiled, proud I had helped, that I had done what root workers were supposed to do, respect the earth and its creatures, and I had done it on my own. 
That night I lay in bed with Dinah on my chest. I stroked her hair as I whispered to her. Why was the trap out there? Dinah's mouth was turned down and her little cloth body shook. Mama said the trap was usually in Doc's cabin, but I know he wouldn't have set it out there near the house. She didn't have any answers. Me and Jay were really lucky we didn't get caught up in that trap. If the wolf got caught, that meant it was set out in the open and dangerous position, likely for the exact purpose of catching something or someone. Then I remembered. On the day of Grand's funeral, Deputy Collins had been at our house when we got home. There was no way to ha know how long he'd been there, but he had pried off the lock on Doc's cabin and gone inside. Could he have taken the animal trap and set it in the woods for Mama or Doc or me, even me or Jay to step on? There was no way I could know for sure. This time, I was the one shaking. The night was pleasantly warm, but I suddenly felt cold all over. I set Dinah on the windowsill and turned her, face to, turned her to face outside. Knowing she was keeping a lookout, I was finally able to get a little sleep.